Welcome, everyone. My name is Julie Grace. I am a policy analyst in the Badger Institute Center for Opportunity. Um, thanks for joining us today for one of our Badger Institute symposium series. Today, we will be discussing why Wisconsin should reform our current expungement law. Um, if you're not familiar with the Badger Institute, we are a free market think tank based here in Milwaukee. We cover issues that affect the entire state of Wisconsin, like criminal justice reform, which we will be discussing today. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly thank two of our sponsors for this event, MMAC, the Metropolitan Milwaukee Association of Commerce, as well as Associated Bank. I would also like to thank our two panelists that we have joining us today, Shanielle McLeod, who runs Clean Slate Milwaukee, and Kelly Thompson, our state public defender. Um, if you uh, are unable to join us for the whole event, or if you'd like to share with someone after, we will be recording this and uh, we'll have copies available within the next week or so, as well as on our website, www.badgerinstitute.org. So I am going to start off by asking our panelists some questions, um, but throughout the presentation, feel free to submit your own questions via the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we will hopefully get to most of those at the end of this presentation. Um, if you have any questions or comments or ideas on anything that we discussed today, my email is julie at badgerinstitute.org. All right, let's get started. Um, Kelly, I, I'm just going to start off with a question for you. Um, so as the state public defender, your office oversees, I believe, 370 attorneys in 40 offices across the state. You represent, your office represents thousands of clients each year, many of whom I assume would be eligible for an expungement. Can you just start us off today by sharing how the current process of obtaining an expungement works and uh, what changes are being proposed to, to change that process. Well, thank you so much, Julie, for inviting me to speak and thank you to, for uh, the, to the Badger Institute for having this um, discussion. It's such an important discussion, not only for the individuals that you've talked about that are our clients here at the Public Defender's Office, but other people that are involved in the criminal justice system and quite frankly, it's, this is an important issue for families, communities, our workforce, our employers, employees. Um, so it really touches so many people throughout Wisconsin. So as you mentioned, we have about 370 attorneys representing in our office in all 72 counties with the, within those 40 offices. And then we have individuals in the private sector who take our conflict cases and overflow cases. So there are, you know, uh, private defense attorneys that represent in these cases as well. And the current process is that individuals who are 25 and younger, who have been charged and then convicted of a crime that's either a misdemeanor or what we call an H felony or less. And those are individuals who are looking at exposure time, um, time that they could potentially go to jail or prison um, would be under six years. So those individuals are oftentimes the ones that would be in the category to be considered for expungement. And those individuals, um, the, the biggest issue is it, the decision has to be made at the time of sentencing. And that is really significant because we're asking the justice system, we're asking the attorneys, we're asking everyone involved to make these decisions at a time prior to when anyone's had a chance to even um, had their, followed through on their sentence, have had been back out at working. It's not that they shouldn't be able to consider at that time, but when it's limited to that, we are missing all those individuals who perhaps it wasn't brought up at the time of sentencing. It wasn't brought up um, by the attorney or, or wasn't being considered. The judge didn't think it was appropriate at that time. We're not giving them an opportunity to look down the road when someone's done with their sentence to say, hey, you've done a great job. This would really benefit you. And um, it's something that we should be considering now. And that's, that's one of the biggest and most significant changes in the, the law that is proposed today. Great, thank you. Um, Shanyal, I'll turn now to you. Um, before, before we get into to, um, the proposed changes, can you just give us all an overview of what Clean Slate Milwaukee is and uh, what work you do there? You're, I think you're on mute. 
Sorry. Thank you again, um, Julie and the Badger Institute, um, and also Kelly, um, for the invite and for doing such a very important um, event that speaks to a topic that I personally have been following since 2007. Um, I started Clean Slate in 2012 as an effort to help individuals remove the barriers to employment, housing, higher education. We promote equal opportunity and equal access for people that have paid their debt to society. Um, and want nothing more than to be self-sufficient. Um, since 2012, uh, we've been able to help um, and assist in more than 2,300 records to be expunged. We work primarily here in the city of Milwaukee. And every day, every single day, we, we're meeting people um, that is this close, you know, to getting that, getting that job, but they're turned away because of something that's on their record is sometimes 10 to 15 years you know, years ago. And I also want to say that, you know, expungement is more than just about criminal records. As far as convictions, we do um, expungement of dismissed cases. So you can be, um, you can be alleged, you know, something can be alleged and if the case can be either dismissed or not prosecuted entirely, but it's still on your record. Even if it's 20 years later, 30 years later, it's still on your record. And so we help and assist in um, expungement of dismissed and not prosecuted cases as well. Great, thank you. Um, and before we, we move on, I just wanna give a quick overview um, of, of what expungement is, maybe if anyone's not familiar. Um, it's essentially the, the sealing of a record. And like Kelly mentioned in Wisconsin, it is, um, you're only eligible for uh, misdemeanors or H&I felonies. Um, so the current system as it is set up, a judge has to um, rule on whether someone gets an expungement at the time of sentencing. However, there is a, a bill in the legislature that would move that decision to after someone has served their sentence when they have more information available. The bill would also remove the current age requirement, which is 25 years old. So I just wanted to make sure that that um, we were all on the same page with that. Um, but Kelly, I wanna turn back to you. Um, what impact would an expungement have on someone with one of these low level offenses um, who's either trying to re-enter society from prison or or just move on from a past offense. Can you talk a little bit about that? So in Wisconsin, we have, um, if you look across the broad screen, a scheme of employment, housing, educational opportunities, our individuals um, are looking at somewhere between over 600 collateral consequences. And these collateral consequences are essentially obstacles, restrictions and limitations that have been put in place, um, some intentionally, some unintentionally, and they keep individuals from living in certain places in, in cities and towns and villages. It also uh, limits where they can work. It limits um, the type of work that they can do. It limits driving. It limits um, educational opportunities. Individuals who are looking at grant or scholarship funding, it can, um, if individuals have certain housing, it can limit them from living or restrict them from living in those housing. So these, these convictions, um, as Chanel has often said, so I'm going to take her line, it, it's a life sentence. And we really can't forget that, that individuals who have been involved in the criminal, criminal justice system, who are trying to, you know, restart their life, um, or, you know, find employment, take care of their families, become a part of society, we keep saying, that's great, but no, that's great, but no, that's great, but no. And what happens is, unfortunately, individuals end up back in the criminal justice system. So if our goal is to have individuals that are working, that are being productive members in our community, that are lifting that burden, I will tell you what I hear over and over, and I'm sure Chanel hears this over and over, individuals who, you know, maybe at a young age or were dealing with difficulties in their, in their own life, um, they get involved in the criminal justice system, and then we're looking at 10, 20, you know, 30 years down the road, that burden is still there. 
Um, and that burden impacts not only them, but their families. And if we have the opportunity to look, to say, you have done all of this, and if we can lift this, if we can remove this for you to really be able to you know, attain your goals, to again, take care of your family, to be in the community in the way that you want to be in the community, I think we would have some great success. I think it impacts our business community, it impacts our families, we talk about public safety a lot in the criminal justice system. I think if we're if we're helping people stay out of the criminal justice system, then we are all, then we're promoting public safety. And this new legislation, this new bill that is bipartisan, which is terrific, really gives the opportunity to look backwards. So individuals who have had these criminal convictions, they um, have gone through the system. They are being they have had success in their lives. We have a chance to look back and and help remove some of those barriers and remove that conviction. And that's pretty significant. And the age restriction that you talked about as well is really important. It really, it, it provides people, I, I would think that individuals who get involved in the criminal justice system, again, for, a, you know, for a variety of different ages or different reasons, we would want to really support someone who's 29, 30, 35, 40, who can then um, come out on the other end and really want to be, to be successful. So this is an issue that really, I think, directly impacts so many of us, and if we can keep people from re-entering the criminal justice system by giving them opportunities, then I think we, we have real, some real opportunity for success. I agree. Yeah. So Shanyelle, we've, we've spoken about this issue multiple times, um, and but for some people, H and I felonies and misdemeanors, we don't really know what we're talking about there. So um, tell us, you know, I know you work with people getting them expungements all the time, but give us maybe one or two examples of crimes that would be eligible or the type of people that this legislation would impact. Yes. Um, I know you could probably go on for the rest of the hour on this question, um, but maybe just give us a sense of, of the type of people we're talking about here. I am so glad you asked that because when people hear criminal, you know, their mind goes to mo the most heinous crimes possible, rape, murder, and to the contrary, we're not talking about rapists or murderers at all, actually. We're talking about low level, most, most of the time drug charges. You know, we're talking about marijuana cases. The bulk of that 2,300 plus number that I mentioned earlier, those are marijuana. I would say a good 85% of those is marijuana cases, cases that should have never probably been felonies in the first place. Um, we're talking about low level um, victimless. It's important to say victimless crimes. You know, um, back long in the 90s, you know, there was a there was an issue that happened with food stamp fraud or AFDC fraud. You know, even, even after the funds are reimbursed or paid back, that person still has a felony until today. So we're talking about, you know, people who have records. I can I can tell you about a, a case where a guy, Mr. Clement, you know, that um, party to a crime, they stole a bike out of West Alice, felony conviction. He said, I wasn't even right driving the bike. I was being pumped on the bike and we got convicted, you know, or Miss Claudine, you know, uh, I'm sorry, Miss Claudette, I'm sorry. Miss Claudette that, that received a, a, a prostitution solicit, soliciting of an of a undercover cop charge back in 1978. And now fast forward until today, you know, she can't even get into senior living because you can't get into any government subsidized housing with the felony conviction. And so this has had a lifetime impact on her. She's in her 60s now. This is something that happened in her early 20s, you know, or even teenage years. And, you know, Kelly already said it, without expungement, every sentence is a life sentence, whether you stole a snicker or a car, whether you, you know, we're not talking about violent charges here. I just want to make that clear. We're not talking about people who impose themselves on other people sexually. We're not talking about sexual violence. We're talking about low level victim, victimless crimes that you know people are remorseful for you know I, I hear it i see it all the time where people you know have some pot you know and i'm not condoning it i'm not condoning bad behavior i'm just saying people paid their debt 
You know, um, I, I can't tell you the, the amount of stories that I hear from the college campuses mm -hmm. of, you know, college graduation party, they're smoking, you know, marijuana, they get raided by the police. And now you have a felony conviction and you can't even, you know, actualize that education that you just pay so much for and work so hard for. And it's just, it's just not helpful. It's just not helpful to, you know, continue to restrict people, you know, for decades at a time. You know, uh, Kelly just spoke so eloquently about our workforce, you know, and, and the manufacturers that, you know, will leave if we cannot provide them with a workforce, our homelessness rates are going up more and more every year. You know, um, people that can't rent in certain neighborhoods or, you know, men can't put their names on the lease in houses that they probably even are paying the rent for because of an old drug conviction from 1991, from 1987, still having an impact on their lives until today. Yeah, um, I I think we could all give examples, but those those really illustrate the issue very well. Um, I have just a follow up question, Chanyal. So a main part of this proposed legislation would allow someone to petition for an expungement after they've served a sentence. Do you have people um, coming to you now, or have you in, in years past looking to get an expungement who just didn't know that it was available at the time? Um, and, and unfortunately you have to tell them now that, that too late, um, do people come to you saying that, or is there a disconnect, um, there at all? So are you, are you saying that they were eligible for expungement and then they're not, can, can you say the question one more time? Yeah, sorry. Um, and Kelly, feel free to jump in here as well, but, um, if people don't happen to petition for an expungement at the time of sentencing, that's their only chance as the oh, law is yeah. currently written. Um, whereas if this legislation was passed, they would they would be allowed to petition for one after they serve their sentence. Um, so do, it's, do you it's think heartbreaking. That it's heartbreaking because, you know, like you said, I hear the stories. I hear the stories where, you know, they've they've gone to school or they got some type of trade and they want to get the record expunged because the employer told them, yeah, I will give you this job if the record is expunged or you can seal that somehow, you know, um, and they meet all the criteria, all the criteria that that uh, Kelly just spoke of that hit all the bullet points, but it wasn't mentioned at the time of sentencing. And I will also say that expungement is a it's not necessarily a criminal justice issue so much as a sentencing justice issue where it's had to be determined at the time of sentencing. So now some judges, some judges, not all, will set expungement right up at the top of your know, CCAP and say future expungement, you know, is, is set up. They groom the case for expungement. If this person complete probation successfully, do everything that they're ordered to do, whether it be community service, whether it be AODA, whatever it is that the sentencing or the conditions of the sentences, they complete that successfully, they're set up for expungement right in, right then. But to answer your question, absolutely. Absolutely. I More than I want to hear, probably mm -hmm. hundreds of times where a person was eligible for expungement technically, but if their judge, if their attorney didn't bring it up, the judge don't bring it up, so it's not mentioned. I've right. heard the judge say it themselves, like, well, the, their attorney didn't mention it, so I didn't bring it up. And here it is 14, 15 years later, you know, yeah. um, they still have the record and they can't do what they need to do. Yeah, Kelly, anything to add there? No, uh, Chanel's completely correct. Uh, it okay. could be just a, a missed opportunity, someone forgot, something happened. And you have to remember, I mean, there are judges that are reluctant to um, grant expungement at the time of sentencing because they want to see how this individual does. Mm -hmm. uh, so that restriction is, it, it really, the disparity we've seen um, in our different communities and how it is treated, you know, Chanel talked about drug convictions, you know, different communities, different counties treated them differently. And now we have individuals who, what, somewhere in Wisconsin, probably one over 
what, almost 1.5 million people in Wisconsin have a criminal record. And oftentimes that is just what has happened, um, how people have been treated in different, different communities, different counties by different judges. And if we have an, an opportunity to, to fix some of this by looking backward, I think, and really, again, what we've all talked about is really just providing this opportunity for an individual. Um, you know, this person has to still petition a judge. The person's going to have to prove that they've done well. They're going to have to prove that, that it's a good idea. It's a good opportunity. I mean, this isn't just down the road that everyone's with, with something will then get their record expunged. So it really is, it's, it provides us one more tool one more opportunity to really help individuals to to get back into the workforce to be you know part of their community to take care of their families and it's something that Chanelle can talk about what other states are doing that this is we other states have really expanded in this area of reform because they've just seen the benefits of to the individual and to the families and i wanted to just um, address one of your um, individuals asked what an hni felony is it was an H or an I. So in felonies, they they give them um, letters and it depends on how serious they are. So the H and I are considered the, the lower end of the felony rung. It could be as um, theft uh, with a certain amount. Um, so, and it's looked at as someone who's the exposure is six years or less for individuals. So I just wanted to, to clarify that because I saw that, that question. Yes, thank you. So Kelly, um... Another question for you. Um, so some, some opponents of this proposed legislation to modify our expungement law in Wisconsin claim that we are taking public information away or we're removing records from CCAP, which is our um, circuit court uh, data system, essentially. Um, how would you respond to that argument? I have heard that argument and I understand that we're in an, an age where people want as much information as that as they can get and I, that's understandable. Um, but this is in this area, especially with limiting that information on CCAP gives individuals an opportunity to to succeed the information that is that is on CCAP these sentencing these convictions. We know these are harming individuals. So while I understand it's a balance, I think with this new legislation, the balance tips towards really um, helping the individual, helping the person um, come out from underneath that that conviction, um, especially in these lower end, you know, convictions that we've been talking about. So there is, there definitely is, um, we have heard this criticism where, you know, we, in Wisconsin, we're really, we're very fortunate um, for a number of my clients, very unfortunate, but CCAP provides a lot of information. Um, people can do all kind of, uh, kinds of searches and, and, and people like to have information, but oftentimes that we know that information when it comes to the convictions are harming are harming our people, um, are harming our, our neighbors, they're har harming our family members. And I think when in that balance, um, this legislation really did a nice job with the balance and limiting the amount of information that would be on CCAP. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Shanyal, um, question for you. Before this, we were discussing how many states have actually gone quite further than Wisconsin with related to their expungement law. I know you're super well connected um, on this issue really across the country. Um, we've spoken about Michigan a little bit um, in, in other states as well. Um, do you wanna share with us a little bit about what you've seen elsewhere and how Wisconsin compares? Yes, yeah, so I have been studying, um, like I said, since studying the expungement since 2007 and um, since 2007, I've gotten a chance to, you know, study our surrounding states expungement and notice that they are light years ahead of us, <laughs> especially Illinois. Illinois is 15 to 20 years ahead of us. Um, Michigan, just right across the lake here, you know, just passed one of the most expansive, you know, expungement laws in history. You know, um, Indiana have better expungement laws. And I was just in Dallas in December and, you know, just talking to their workforce development teams. And, um, and I noticed that in the state of Texas, this says a lot, 
This says a lot when the state of Texas expungement laws are better than ours. Basically, um, if your felony is more than five years old and your misdemeanor is over three years old, you can petition to the courts to get your record expunged. They have time limits. So Wisconsin is backwards, right? Wisconsin cares more about the age of the person than the age of the offense. So basically speaking, if a person was born in the 90s, they're almost a shoe in for expungement now. But if your case is from the 90s, it's not eligible for expungement. So we are we are backwards, we're behind. Our model is forward, but we are so backwards. You know, um, it's, you know, I think we're the only state that I can think of that has an age limit, you know. Um, as other states are separated by juvenile and adult records, yes. But, you know, to have that age limit and that cutoff, that very technical strict cutoff, so that, you know, let's just say that if somebody was arrested, you know, um, for something nonviolent, of course, and they were arrested at 24 years old, but the case drug out to after their 25th birthday, they would have been eligible at first, but depending on how long it took the courts to convict them um, or even offer them to defer prosecution, don't even get me started on who gets to defer prosecution and who doesn't, but how long it takes to convict them, now they're not eligible because it's that technical. It's that technical. If it happened after July 9th or July 1st, I'm sorry, July 1st of 2009, you know, if I'm sorry, if it happened before that time, you're not eligible. But if it happened like two days after, you're eligible. Same crime, same offense, same everything. You know, it's just technical like that. And we're not winning that way. <laughs> we are not winning as a state that way. So why don't we talk about the age restriction a little bit more? Because I saw a question related to that. Um, as it is currently written, only those 25 years or younger, like you said, would be eligible for an expungement. This proposed law would wipe that. And so, and it would also be retroactive. Um, what would you say to someone that says, you know, only, only those who are younger or still developing should be eligible? Um, what would you say to that? And, and why should someone who's 26, 30, 40, 50 um, now be eligible from, I guess I'll pose that to, to either one of you or both of you. I, and I understand that that may be an argument. I'm not sure why we would ever want to, someone who's gone through their entire life, they're now 40 years old and something, some crisis happens, something happens in their life and they're convicted of a, a crime in this, in this group of crimes that we've talked about. Uh, and they make it through their sentence, why we wouldn't want to give that person a second chance. I, you know, I, I, I don't know, we're harming the individuals. Um, but we're harming all of us. The more people we keep out of our workforce, the more people that we keep from supporting their families is that harms our communities. So, you know, people are not getting a free pass. I think people are always, there's a concern that somehow someone's getting a free pass. Um, this is not the case. These are individuals who have been convicted, have had success, have been successful finishing up their sentences, have gone through either time in jail or time in prison or um, gone on probation or some type of extended supervision. But again, it gives us an opportunity to say, okay, let's move forward for this. We, it's what Shanyel talked about. We want people to move forward, I believe. I certainly do. Um, and I think, you know, when you have something arbitrary like the 25, we need to look at it in individual assessments. Um, you know, 25 is arbitrary. And I think if we have an opportunity to really expand this and to allow others in the system who have been, again, convicted of a crime, this is an opportunity. And I think removing that restriction is really provides um, an opportunity for others. Mm -hmm. So Shanyal, back to you. Um, like I said, you're super well connected to a lot of groups in Milwaukee who are and across the state, I should say, that are interested in this issue. And the proposed legislation is extremely bipartisan. Um, why do you think, from your perspective, so many people support it? I know you're, you're, you speak with groups on this all the time. Give us a sense of you know, why this bill is so popular from groups on both the left and right. 
Um, for a variety of reasons. Um, it's first, let me just start off by saying, um, my partner, uh, in crime, no point attended, um, <laughs> Evan Goyke. Evan Goyke has been phenomenal since before he ran, you know, for state, uh, representative representative in 2012 we talked about this in great length and he's been on it since day one so he has been extremely smart and jumping across the aisle right away we didn't waste any time you know and so um alberta darling is leading you know right now and first of all shout out to alberta darling because she's been fantastic on this as well um it's, 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 how can I say this? It's a multifaceted, you know, um, it's, it's multi-levels because um, it's not just a Milwaukee thing. It's not just a black thing. This is not just, it's not a race thing at all. It's a Wisconsin thing, you know? And I believe that, um, you know, other counties, other, um, you know, with the Republican side, the GOP side have gotten involved because it just makes sense. You know, um, I received a, a memo, uh, I wanna say about a month ago, that says that in 2018, um, in 2018, the state of Wisconsin was owed $56 million. And I can provide proof, you know, this statement, it was owed $56 million in restitution but they were only able to collect $9 million. And anybody knows anything about expungement and getting an expungement, you can't get it without your fines, fees and restitution being paid back to the state. So they now see a price tag. They now see a financial incentive to um, get this done. The Right on Crime organization, that's their um, mission is to reduce the spending and corrections. We're spending way too much and getting nothing in return. Like, what is it? What does it benefit us locking up people that does drugs instead of properly rehabbing them? What the the Department of Correction has become the largest mental health facility in the state. So we're not, we don't have time to get off into the, the defunding of the mental health organization that now, you know, all these people are now being incarcerated, you know, when they have, you know, uh, chronic mental health issues, you know, so, and that leads to the drugs. So when you, it's a cycle, right? So when you have mental health issues, people self-cope, people self-cope you know, with drugs and alcohol, those things lead you into jail, you know, now you're on probation, you fail a drug test because you use alcohol and marijuana, boom, you're right back. So we talking about crimeless revocations where it's an ongoing process, it's an ongoing process. So it, it's financial incentive. That's why mm -hmm. I believe it, we're spending way too much money. That's why I believe they're, you know, Anybody that's uh, fiscally respons responsible, this makes perfect sense to them. I mm -hmm. I think uh, Chanel is correct. I mean, this we uh, we do spend a, a significant amount of money in the criminal justice system that could be uh, diverted to other areas. Um, when we when we try and deal with all healthcare issues and mental health issues in the criminal justice system, we're we're not going to be we're not going to be um, successful. But it's exactly what Chanel talked about. There's the we know the human impact. We know the individual, what this means for individuals. We know there's a workforce issue. I mean, in a significant workforce issue, we've talked about. I mean, we're an older state. We have low unemployment, and we have individuals who want to. They need workers for their their businesses. They want to expand their businesses, but they need to be able to employ individuals. And if we continue to set up barriers, they are not going to be able to employ um, our clients. There's something in this for everyone to like. There really is, and it, it's opportunity. I can't get over the fact that, I mean, we, we're providing opportunity for individuals. And without this opportunity, what we're creating, we're creating more clients for me. Because at some point in time when people can't succeed, they're going to spiral down 
and they're going to be back in the criminal justice system. There is no doubt about that. I mean, we've seen it over and over and over. And so this is an opportunity to really give people the chance to succeed. Thank you both that for putting that so well. Um, and Chanyal, you're right. This is an issue that, that doesn't only impact Milwaukee. We researched this back in 2017, I believe, when we released a report that looked at just a few counties, um, but um, diverse counties across the state. And we found that there are disparities amongst even rural counties um, with regards to the number of crimes eligible and then the number of, number of expungements given, which, which is super interesting. Um, Kelly, I, I have one more question for you and then we will turn to audience Q&A. So if anyone has any, feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A box. Um, but, but Kelly, since you're the only lawyer on this call today, um, I wanted to ask you what impact you think moving the decision from the time of sentencing to after a sentence has been served, what impact would that have um, on, on a judge's decision and then also on the individual's likelihood of actually getting an expungement? Well, I hope the impact would be a positive one where the judges get to look backward and say, look at someone and they get to hear their story. You know, they're not just seeing that individual who they're perhaps frustrated with or angry with or not sure how things are going to go at the time of sentencing. They get to look, they get to take that person at that time and all the way through to say all of the, everything that the person has accomplished. And that Yell has given us a lot of um, context and examples of what people have to do to even get to that point of expungement. And the judge gets to see that. So I think that impact is that, again, what we've talked about, that human impact is really important. There is no doubt that there is a workload impact and there will be a workload impact because we're asking those judges who, you know, it's no longer just at the time of sentencing, it's we're looking, we're asking them to look backward. But again, I think uh, for the greater good and for the broader opportunities, it's, it's this legislation is, is worth it. It gives our, it gives individuals a chance it gives them a chance to um, to really succeed. And so, while there is there will be workload um, opportunity or a workload issue, um, and I think there has been you know some talk conversations with that. And I know as Shanyal has talked about the the co the co sponsors in the assembly are Representative Goyke, former public defender, who who has mm -hmm. talked I'm sure to many judges about this, and then Representative St uh, Dave Steffen, who's also been really involved in this. Th these are. These are conversations that are happening, but I think we've seen we've seen the limitations by just having it at sentencing. And I think when you to weigh the possibilities for individual, it's it's worth the impact. And it's important and, also to note that the decision still rests with the judge, regardless of when yeah. the decision mm -hmm. is being made. Absolutely. Um, we're not doing automatic expungements or anything like that. I know other states have. We're just moving the 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 time when the decision has to be made. Well, and I think um, you remember, Julie, too, a lot of these cases, it's what Chanel said, it could be, you know, a possession of marijuana, it could be mm -hmm. a theft, a retail theft case. These are the, what we've talked about, the people that we see um, with the felonies from because of the, the former welfare fraud. Um, you know, there are a fair number of cases where pretty quickly, I think a, a pretty quick review for someone who, you know, it happened when they were, 18, 19, 20, 22, 23, 25, and now they're 50, 55, or, or younger. I mean, because we want people um, to be able to, to look at that even at younger ages, but we see that um, that, it, that people have, they've moved forward in their life in a successful way. And I think that's, a, that's honestly in the criminal justice system, I think that's a good thing for all of us to see because we don't always get that opportunity. We see the negative. <laughs> we see when people are revoked back in the um, prison system. We see people who have multiple criminal convictions. This gives people an opportunity to see that people have can succeed following um, a criminal conviction. Exactly. And if I can just jump in really quickly, really sure. quickly. Of course. Um, just really quickly. So when we go up for the city hearings, right, we were smooth selling. We had the district attorneys that come from Eclair, La Crosse, you know, they all speak in favor. The district attorneys that speak in favor of expungement. Um, our only opposition has, and, and I'm not, this is not hearsay. Um, our only opposition was the media, the press. 
because they want those records. And what it was told to me was they said, well, we want those records. The reporters want those records because if someone decides to run for public office, then we want to be able to know their past, right? And I said, well, an expungement don't give you your rights back. That would be a pardon. You understand what I'm saying? A pardon gives people their rights back, their right to run for public office and, you know, um, and all the votes and stuff like that, right? And so I'm like that, I wanted to speak to, I don't want to call it ignorance because I don't want to sound rude, but the misconception of what this will do, you know, um, like we're saying, like we're, we keep saying, and I'll keep saying it, we're not trying to let people off. We're not trying to let mass murderers or rapists off of anything. Anybody that we're in reference to have already done their time. And if the judge wanted them to do life, he should have gave them life, but he didn't, she didn't. And so, you know, that's my message to the press, the Mark Bellings of the world, the media, that think we're just letting people off scot-free and that's so far from the truth. If you care anything about Wisconsin, this will matter to you because we need to get people back into the workforce. We need to make sure that families are together in households and not separated because dad or mom can't put their name on the lease because something old that happens, it's time to get over it. It's time to move forward. That's our model and that's where we should be going. Yeah, Julie, I'll also add, you know, we get we received a letter from an individual whose daughter um, 34 years ago, I think, was convicted of a receiving stolen property or using a, a credit card. Um, the record was expunged um, if she was, you know, and she was successful. But the record does not go away from from like the DOJ and the NCI, um, NCIC reports. People can still find those information. And this is something that has has impacted her. Her she actually moved out of state, according to her father, because she just could not find employment in the areas that she'd gone to school for. You know, and Shanelle talked earlier about just having just think of people who have gone through uh, schooling and then find out at the end, oh, sorry, you can't get a job in this area after all yeah. the time and commitment you've put into yeah. it. So she actually moved out of state. So these records don't disappear. Um, they are still there to be found if necessary, but it gives people an opportunity. Um, it, it limits them. And that limitation can really make a difference for individuals. Yeah, so Kelly, just to follow up on that, because there is a question related to, to the DOJ still retaining the record. Um, so I'll, I'll just pose that to you. Um, why is that record not seal, sealed from DOJ and um, who has access to that? I know it's not, once a record is expunged, it's not on CCAP, but who would have access to the DOJ record? People who are doing a criminal background check on someone, the record is okay. there. Um, and you know, for certain licenses, for certain reasons, that 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 record is that record continues to be there, and that will not that will not disappear. Um, that is not one that that ends up being sealed um, or removed. So people still that is something that people still have to contend with. And I guess <clears throat> I'll just give one more example. Um, I spoke to a woman and actually wrote an article about her very recently, if anyone hasn't seen it yet. Um, and she's very open about her, her case and her situation. And she's offered to testify and, and was happy for me to share her story. When she was, I think, 26, um, she found her, her then boyfriend in the act of cheating on her. Um, she vandalized his car and the other woman's car. Um, but fast forward, I think 20 or 25 years, She's employed. She's actually a teacher at MPS. She runs a home daycare center. She's married to, to a different man. Um, she has two kids. She's about to be a grandmother. Um, and when her husband went to, to try to rent an apartment in Texas because he got a job there, she couldn't be on the lease, she found, because of that record from decades ago when she was 26. And she admits it was a very stupid, dumb mistake. And, and she says she uses it as a teaching moment for her students now. But um, unfortunately, it's still it's still with her. And so, you know, the, her husband was able to to just get a lease by himself in, in Texas. But um, just, you know, one of many, many examples of people who this bill would um, would help would impact. And the reason she wasn't eligible at the time was because she was 26 instead of 25. Um, 
Another question that we have is, do we have a sense of when action might be taken on this bill? Um, I should have mentioned already, but this bill is actually very similar to another version that was passed by the assembly last session, but never taken up in the Senate. Um, I do not have any uh, crystal ball as to when the legislature will act on it this session, um, but it is in both respective committees in the assembly and the Senate, so. Can I just add that two years in a row, we passed the assembly 95 to zero, unanimous, unanimous. It gets to the Republican, not just the Republican, but the Republican caucus and it dies there. We were down one vote, one single vote last session, one vote away. And my thing is this, bring it to the floor. Bring it to the floor, vote against it. You know, if it's Senator Bradley, Senator, all the senators that are against it, all I ask is stay against it, just bring it to the floor. You know, if 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 Senator Scott, I'm, I'm sorry, yes, yeah, Senator Fitzgerald would have brought it to the floor and voted against it, tell your constituents all the reasons why you voted against it. Just bring it to the floor, it would have been 30 to 30 to three, we're out, we're done. Just bring it to the floor. That's it. You want to be against it? Stay against it. <laughs> just bring it to the floor and vote against it. We have the we have the votes. It just gets stuck in a in a in this in a um, Republican caucus. I think there's so many um, bills that are out there right now too, um, Julie. That legislators, it, it's helpful if they hear from their constituents. It's helpful yep. that they hear that this is important. That they that people. That, that people recognize this is an important piece of legislation. You know, we're during a budget time now, things are moving very quickly, people have a lot on their plates, but when legislators hear from, you know, the people that live down the street from them and live in their communities and shop in their grocery stores and say, hey, I understand what this piece of legislation can do, and it makes a difference. And I, you know, I'm asking you to support it. The legislators take that seriously. And I think sometimes, you know, these these are to me are extraordinarily important pieces of legislation, but getting the general public to really understand that um, and the difference that it can make. And, and and they really are the they are the individuals that legislators want to hear from. They want to know that their constituents, this matters to them and it should matter to them. And so letting letting them know really does make a difference. Yeah. And I think also just continuing to humanize the issue as well. Um, we could all give many more examples of people who this legislation would impact. And like you said earlier, Kelly, too often we only hear the, the negative examples of people re-entering the criminal justice system and cycling in and out. Um, but these people are have moved on for the most part, or, or they want to be employed, or they want to, to find housing or, or go to school or college. Um, and so these are the people that I think, regardless of which side of the aisle you're on, these are the people that we want, we want to help because they're the successes of the criminal justice system. Um, the legislation does not, does not allow any other prior felony convictions. And so these are not people who have a long list of, of a criminal background. It's just one, it's just one crime that we're talking about here. I think people would, if you, the story that you gave about the woman that vandalized the car or someone that, you know, had a marijuana conviction or had a retail theft conviction. And, and if people really realize that, you know, four and five and 10 years down the road, it's impacting where they can live. It's impacting where they can have a job. It's impacting so many parts of their life that people would really realize that we're not, we're not helping, we're not helping anyone. Um, you know, we have individuals who, you know, can't go home to live with their, their parents. I mean, these are young people because of subsidized housing that um, they're limited and restricted. We, we have smart, smart, smart kids that have made a mistake and it's a criminal mistake and they've been convicted, but they've done well and they can't go on to school. I mean, are these individuals that we don't, I, I just can't imagine these are not the people that we really want to give opportunity to. Um, and as Chanel said, I, you know, I want to reinforce, this is not a Milwaukee issue. This is not a Madison issue. This is not an urban issue. This impacts all 72 counties. Um, and it impacts individuals and families in all 72 counties. So we see this across the board. We did a, we did an, a, an expungement uh, clinic and um, 
in our Hmong population showed up, you know, more than it. And it actually stunned me, you know, that, you know, we, we talk about, you know, the African-American community and the white community and the Latinos, but the Hmong population is left out of the equation too, because we don't even ask them, how is this impacting them? They showed up to tell me. They showed up to tell me that their story needs to be told too. And they're voters as well, and they don't need to be ignored, but they're cycling in and out of the criminal justice system for drugs too. I can promise you drugs is in every neighborhood. I promise you. I can promise you regardless of your economic status or level or your level of pigmentation, drugs are around. And if drugs are around, police are around. Police are around, here come the criminal records and it's a cycle. It goes over and over. Yeah. Kelly, a follow-up question that someone asked, um, would the information on the DOJ include the fact that the record was expunged? There's, I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure on this, but I believe there's, uh, there's oftentimes a note okay. that mentions it has been expunged that I, I haven't done a, one of the reports um, or haven't reviewed one in a while, but I, I believe that there's sometimes some type of a note there identifying that, but I, I cannot say that, I cannot guarantee that. Okay. I can tell you it doesn't. I can tell you it doesn't. These systems don't communicate. So you got the county and you got the state level. And we used to be a time where whatever you can get expunged from CCAP, you cannot get expunged from the DOJ. Whatever you can get expunged from the DOJ, meaning non prosecution or dismissed cases, you cannot get expunged from CCAP. So um, it was, it's a mismatch. And so I would like to see that. I would actually like to see anything that's expunged from CCAP be expunged from the DOJ, you know? And if a person reoffends, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But I can almost tell you, I've never done an expunge with somebody reoffended. They're off to the races. They're mm -hmm. off living their best lives and new careers and, you know, I can, I can, we made a movie. <laughs> we made a movie on the before and after effects of expungement. It's called the expungement experiment that you guys will see soon, you know, sooner or later. But I can tell you that nobody's reoffended. There's no need to keep these records, you know, to hold against people, especially if they're decades old. So to answer your question, once something uh, is expunged from CCAP, no, it's not expunged from DOJ, but I would like to see that happen, at least sealed up. It's, why? It's not even a full expungement. And I, I don't want to I don't want to minimize the fact that it would be expunged from CCAP either because um, we do have a very expansive um, court data system in Wisconsin and so um, anyone can go on and just search and so the fact that it would be expunged from there um, would still be very helpful for for many of these oh, people absolutely. who you know their landlord is is searching them or a future employer etc um, and so yeah um, I know there's a little bit of differences between DOJ and CCAP but the fact that it would be gone from CCAP would still be um, very positive um, okay. So we only have a few more minutes and I know we only we, we only agreed to talk about expungement and so you don't have to answer this question, but um, any other policies that either of you think have a good chance of, of passing this session and um, would impact the state's criminal justice system? I think from our perspective, expungement is probably um, number one on the list, but anything else that either of you have seen or heard or would like to see passed? Um, well, there are a number of policies that I would like to see passed, <laughs> whether they will, whether that's likely or not. We, you know, Wisconsin is one of three or four states that still treat 17-year-olds in all cases as adults. I would, there is, that's in the governor's budget. Again, it has been legislation. It's been, I mean, I think we had 55 to 60 um, legislative co-sponsorships in the past. Um, and bipartisan, I would love to see that go forward. I think individuals, um, it, it's it's very limited, um, I, I know, but it's it's not everybody in the system, but even just to get our, our, our toe in the door, there would be really significant. And we have just, and we're, again, we're, we're so far behind on that. I mean, to be only one of three, uh, one of three or one of four states that still treat our 17 year olds as adults, I think that would be, to me would be a reform that I would love to see go forward. But you know, I think um, I think Department of Corrections, Corrections is working on some expanded 
you know, early release programs, more in the administrative area, but they're looking at, you know, some opportunities there that's, you know, a possibility. I think, um, again, it's just, it's, it's so hard to know at this point in time. Um, unfortunately, in my world, in the, uh, uh, bills that increase penalties and increase charges seem to fly through the legislature and not so much the other way. So, um, so I would really, you know, I would, I would love, I would love to start to really look at some of the reforms that have been proposed by multiple different groups to see if we can really make some pretty significant changes in the, in the justice system. I just don't know if that's really possible now. Um, I would like to see, um, so here in the city of um, Milwaukee or Milwaukee County, should I say, we have two different drug courts. We have a drug treatment court and we have a drug felony court. And the last time I checked, you know, um, anyone that goes through the drug treatment court gets a chance to escape the conviction entirely. As a matter of fact, they don't get a conviction, they get a graduation. And in that graduation, it was almost all white people. I mean, all white people, there wasn't a drip of color in the room. And so um, I would like to see more people have the opportunity at drug treatment court when they only have, you know, uh, marijuana convictions to decriminalize it, first and foremost, to decriminalize marijuana a certain amounts and um, give, open up drug treatment court to all people, you know? And um, I will also, like to speak to the Pardon Advisory Board that was just reopened after nine years of being closed. Um, whatever governor comes, if Governor Evers wins again, beautiful. But if we have a Republican governor, I would really like to see that Pardon Advisory Board stay intact. And, you know, and I really feel like now that this zone, we're on Zoom now, that there can be a Pardon Advisory Board in, in regions, it don't have to just be in Madison. It don't just have to be, you know, there's a part, there's a governor's office right here in the city of Milwaukee. I don't see why we can't have a partner advisory board um, like we did pre COVID here just to get down, you know, just to make sure more people are getting their rights back because partners ironically does a lot more for edu uh, education and uh, licensing and careers than expungements do. You know, um, once you get a pardon, you can pass those boards. You can become a CNA. You can, what it would do for our healthcare field and diversify in those fields. So I, that's what I would like to see. I would like to see our pardon advisory board stay intact and actually expand it. And I would like to see, you know, marijuana decriminalized. I don't, I don't have an opinion on legalization, but decriminalization is definitely a must, especially when you have two different drug courts. Uh, Chanel brought up a really good point and I should, I just wanted to just say a couple of um, points on that with the treatment course, the treatment alternatives and diversion program, and that's had a lot of bipartisan support over the years and has expanded its funding. And so I, I don't even know how many treatment courts we have across the state now, um, but a significant number. And the more, and I know there's additional funding in this year's budget. It's something because I, I think people recognize for every dollar you put in, you save it very, very conservatively, $1.98, I think was the last um, numbers that came out. So getting individuals, and Chanel is right, expanding those programs, expanding those courts, removing some of the restrictions that are there, and quite frankly, making sure that we're getting into all of our communities talking about treatment courts. Some people have um, some very suspicious feelings about them, and we, that's an educational piece, so that people will take part. Because it's it's a and treatment courts are hard. I mean, people have to do a lot of work to get through a treatment court. Um, we have post conviction treatment courts, we have pre conviction, and then we have you know post post charging, but pre-conviction. And so, you know, the more work that we can do on keeping people that we've talked about with healthcare issues, addictions out of the system and find ways to keep them in the community, I think is, is a positive. And I, and I know there, there has been support, bipartisan support um, throughout the years on that. And I think, again, it's, we've been able to really show the money that can be saved when we put those resources on, especially on the front end, if we can do that. Back end is extraordinarily important, but we don't need to just focus there. We need front middle and back end of the system. 
Well, that's a great way to close. Um, we are unfortunately out of time, but thank you, Kelly, and thank you, Shanyelle. I think this has been a really thank productive you. conversation. Like I said, we, we recorded it, and so we will have a recording available, hopefully within the next few days. I wanted to also, once again, thank our sponsors, MMAC and Associated Bank. And for more information on all of our work on expungement, check it out on our website, badgerinstitute.org. Um, and, and we'll be in touch with uh, further research and articles on this, I'm sure. So thank you to everyone who attended and uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon.